magnitude times magnitude times cosine of an angle, but as well as knowing the geometric definitions of these operations, you also have to be aware of the algebraic, the more mathematical expressions. You should know that the dot product is commutative. You should know that the dot product obeys a distributive property. Uh, you should know certain geometrically based things like this. If the dot product of two vectors is equal to zero, what does that tell you about those two vectors? That's a geometric inclusion. Right? So these are all things you have to be comfortable with. The dot product of a vector in itself is always the square of that, uh, the square of that vector's magnitude. These are all things you have to be comfortable with. And I put side by side the geometric definition of the operations and then the more mathematical uh, conditions that those operators satisfy. There's your cross product. There's that great <coughs> right hand rule thing. Magnitude, magnitude times sine is the magnitude. Right hand rotation rule normal to the plane. Uh, cross product is anti commutative as you well know. Here's a good one here. If two vectors have a zero value cross product, what does that tell you about those two vectors? They have to be parallel to one another. So those are things I assume that you know. You should have known those things way back in your stats class. So that's, that's old stuff. Uh, let me show you, again, I wanted to hand this out, but I didn't have a chance to get the copies made. Here is the first page of that general course outline, that cheat sheet I was telling you about. And this is the entire page, page one. And we'll get through this probably before the end of the week. Uh, but I want to start off the course by discussing what's on the top of page one of the general course outline. So I'm going to start right off discussing Essential vector algebra and differential calculus maybe a little bit later. So we're just going to talk about some little essential vector algebra tools. And you're seeing basically four different relationships here. I don't know if any of those make any sense to you right now, but let's see if we can um, explain what you're really looking at here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about that's really, really important in putting in vector analysis is the role played by what's called an orthonormal triad. <coughs> an orthonorm what is an orthonormal triad? Ah, orthonormal. Oops. Well, let's draw a little picture here. In drawing a picture of, a, of an orthonormal triad, first of all, I'm going to draw three little vectors. That's where the tri comes from, the triad three. And I'm going to draw those three little vectors that's, uh, indicating that they're mutually perpendicular to one another. That's the ortho part, orthogonal, orthogonal or perpendicular to one another. And I'm going to indicate that they're all unit vectors. That's the normal part, normalized to one, an orthonormal triad. An orthonormal triad is any set, say it slowly, an orthonormal triad is any set of three mutually perpendicular unit vectors. Uh, and what's the, uh, by the way, the shorthand I'm going to use for this is just capital O N triad, orthonormal triad. Uh, by the way, that triad also might get another little modifier if I write R H O N. Anybody know what I might mean by that? Right hand. What do you think R H stands for? Right hand. Right hand. Uh, what would make a, an orthonormal triad a right-handed as opposed to a left-handed orthonormal triad? Well, it comes to the cross product relationship. Your good old right hand. You have a right-handed orthonormal triad if one cross the two gives you three. If one cross the two gave you minus three, then it would be a left hand orthonormal triad, but you want to stick with right hand orthonormal triads. Okay? So a triad has handedness to it, left or right hand, depending on how the cross product works. Uh, what's the, what's the, orth, the right handed orthonormal triad you're most familiar with? Well, you do a lot of Cartesian analysis. 
As a matter of fact, in, in your dynamics classes, you probably pretty much exclusively use Cartesian analysis. So whenever you have a Cartesian coordinate system, we know that that little Cartesian coordinate system has three little unit vectors associated with it. The I hat, the, most textbooks follow that notation nowadays. The I hat, J hat, and K hat unit vectors are the three mutually perpendicular unit vectors, which are respectively parallel to the underlying Cartesian coordinate axis. So that's the most common example of a, of a right-handed orthonormal triad that we know of. But there are actually many others. <coughs> and I'm going to put this away for now. Let me give you an example of another right-hand orthonormal triad that's very important in the chemistry. And that has to do with a smooth space curve. <coughs> so, I've just uh, traced a, a curve on the board. Now, since I am forced to write on a flat surface, uh, this is really a planar curve that I've been forced to draw. But I'm trying to think a little more broadly. Um, <coughs> I'm thinking more generally, this would be a three-dimensional smooth space curve. So imagine that that's what that is. Three-dimensional smooth space, space curve. It turns out that associating with every single point on a smooth curve, there is a nice set of three little unit vectors. Very special set, they play a very special role. Uh, the first little unit vector is labeled E hat hat indicating it's a unit vector, sub t. What do you think the t stands for? <laughs> Tangent to the curve. Uh, there's a second little unit vector perpendicular to it, labeled E sub n. Do you know what that might be called? You've had your first dynamics class. That's the principal normal to the curve. And then in three dimensions, there's a third little unit vector called the binormal, E sub b third little unit vector, which is actually defined as being the cross product of the tangent with the normal. That's called the binormal unit vector. And as you can see, that set of three little unit, and by the way, if you think of a car driving down the road, if you think of a car driving down the road, <coughs> you sort of think of the tangent vector as being the hood orbit, <coughs> pointing in the direction of motion. And you could think of this normal as being the turn signal indicator flashing the direction that the car is turning, and then I guess this would be the radio antenna poking out the top of the car. But those are three little mutually perpendicular unit vectors. This set E sub T, E sub N, E sub B are called the path basis vectors or path unit vectors. And they are another example of a nice right-handed orthonormal triad. And there are other orthonormal triads that we'll use. There are orthonormal triads associated with the use of cylindrical coordinate systems, which you probably don't have too much experience with. There are also orthonormal triads associated with spherical, or what I call global coordinate systems, which again, you probably have too much experience with. But, but this concept of a right-handed orthonormal triad is not just limited to Cartesian analysis. <coughs> These kinds of sets of vectors come up in various other places as well. Now, let's get down to brass tacks and really identify what makes an orthonormal triad an orthonormal triad. I mean, you can draw all the pictures you want. <coughs> but I claim that there's a very precise mathematical definition of what an orthonormal triad really is. And it starts like this. Let's let M, let's let the letters <coughs> M and N <coughs> represent integer values. Think of them as free indices that can take the values of 1, 2, and 3. What makes an orthonormal triad an orthonormal triad is really this. I claim that no matter how you choose these free indices, m and n, as either 1, 2, or 3, if you dot any one element from the set of 3 with any other, there's only two possible values that you can get. If indeed this set, if indeed this set, E1, E2, <coughs> E3, is an orthonormal triad, <coughs> pardon me, then 
I claim that no matter which one of these you got with any other, there's only two possible values you can get. And anybody want to volunteer what those two possible values would be? One. one, one and is everyone one? Let's put one first. You can get one or you can get zero. You'll never get anything other than that. Can you specify the conditions on the free indices for which you would get a one? If M and N equal... M and N equal to one another. So if M equal N equal one, or M equal N equal two or three, if M is selected to be the same as N in the range of one, two, or three, you're dotting the unit vector with itself. And as you know, whenever you dot a vector with itself, you get the square of that vector's magnitude. The unit vector has magnitude one, one squared is one. Okay? And if you select the two indices so they're not the same, one, two, three, one, three, and two. How are you? If you select them so they're not the same, obviously then you're going to be taking the dot product of two vectors which are perpendicular. So the result of the dot product would be zero. This is actually the defining, this is the mathematical <coughs> defining characteristic of an orthonormal triad. <coughs> That's mathematically what makes an orthonormal triad an orthonormal triad. The right-handed part, you want to add, add something to that. If it is also a right-handed orthonormal triad, we could add another little piece to this. We could add this little graphic, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Maybe you're familiar with this graphic using I hat, J hat, and K hat. And in this case, we just use E1, and E2, and E3. this little circular pattern, arrows going around in this direction with a big cross product symbol in the middle. And how do you how do you read that? It's just a reminder of what the cross products are between these two, between these guys. E1 cross E2, E3, E2 cross E3 is E1, E3 cross E1 is E2. What if, what if you go against it? What if it's E2 cross with E1? Minus E3, if you go against the arrows, it's a minus sign, you go with them, it's a plus sign. Just a little reminder of how the cross product works in a right-handed system. What would you do with this graphic if it was a left-handed system? Just reverse the arrows. But you never want to use a left-handed system. And the reason is that if you use the little determinant computational formula for computing the cross product, if you've chosen a left-handed system, your answer is going to be the opposite of what it should be. So you always want to be careful to stick with uh, right-handed systems if your analysis is going to require any cross-product operations. <coughs> okay, so uh, we've defined what an orthonormal triangle is. <coughs> and it's not that new to you because you've certainly done enough Cartesian analysis. But again, there are other orthonormal triads which are just as important in our analysis. Uh, so let's do the following. Let's assume that we have, someone gives us a right-handed orthonormal triad. And let's assume that somebody, by the way, let's, uh, let's assume that somebody gives us a, such a little triad. And we have those three little vectors. And so I have them originally at this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw three little axes that are parallel to each of the three unit vectors from the set. And then just to split things off, I'll take that little E1 vector and I'll move them down here, slide him out along the line this way. And I'll take the E2 vector and slide him out along that line. I'll slide him out along this line. And let's assume we have some vector at this point, some vector A. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say what kind of vector it is, but we'll just draw that vector up here like this. Capital A stands for any vector, it can be any vector that you can possibly imagine. Let's assume we know its magnitude, which I'll just indicate here with a, with a uh, similar value of A. Now, as you're all aware, uh, three-dimensional Euclidean space has certain properties. And you all know one of those properties is that if you go to a point in three-dimensional space, through any point in three-dimensional space, one can always construct a line which is parallel to any other. So you can go to this point, and you can construct a line which is parallel to this axis over here. 
And you could follow it down until it intersects with this plane. So maybe that's the point where it intersects with that plane. Okay, and then you could draw the line that goes out like this. And then through this point, you could draw the line parallel to that, which would come back looking like this. And you would kind of recognize, I think, that sort of in three-dimensional perspective, had you not constructed a, uh, a rectangle there. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, from the parallelogram rule of vector addition, is it obvious that the vector A can now be written as the sum of a vector that lies down here in the plane, up at A sub P, plus one that goes up in this direction. And since that one is in the three direction, I'll call that the A3 vector. Is it geometrically obvious? Is it geometrically obvious that if you could measure this, if you could climb into this three-dimensional space, and if you could measure that angle, you've already measured the magnitude, then is it obvious that the vector A can be written as the sum of that vector down there in the plane plus that one that goes up in the three direction? Is it equally obvious that this, this vector component down here would be how big? <coughs> would be its magnitude? Magnitude times A, a times cos. You did this kind of stuff in your status class, as a matter of fact. I remember fairly early on in your status class when you were learning about vector algebra, you were doing these kinds of things. Very geometric approach. And the magnitude of this component going up would be what? It would be the same as this equal this. <coughs> that would be the sine component. So I'll try to go over there. That would be A times sine of phi, like this. So it's pretty clear, geometrically, that if I'm given a, 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 an orthonormal triad and some vector A, that I can first of all break that vector into two parts, one that lies in the plane and one that's uh, perpendicular to it. Now, then you can go one step further. Couldn't you come down here and look at this vector? And, and couldn't you go to this point and, and draw a line through that point parallel to this, bring it back here like like so, and then you could draw another line through this point parallel to this, bring it over here like this, and then couldn't you take that a sub p vector and write it as the sum of one that points in the two direction and one that points in the one direction? So you could write a sub p as a1 plus a2. And then when you make this substitution into here, you would see that in the end, when you do both of those <coughs> decompositions, when you take, when you use the parallel parallelogram rule of vector addition in this three-dimensional construction twice, you can see that the vector A can be broken up into the sum of three vector components. Uh, one pointing in the direction of E1, a second pointing in the direction of E2, and a third pointing in the direction of E3. Now, of course, those components, since each of these vectors points in one of those three directions, it's clear that you can write this one as a scalar multiple of E1, you can write the second one as a scalar multiple of E2, and you can write the next one as a scalar multiple of E3. So what I'm saying here is something that you've known about way back from your very first status class, that if you're given a vector, any vector, and you're given an orthonormal triad, a vector in an orthonormal triad we know that that vector has a unique standard form representation relative to that set of basis vectors. We call this, we call this representation the standard form representation of vector A relative to orthonormal triad E1, E2, and E3. And if we were, by the way, if we again, you did this, you did this kind of thing in your status class, knowing the original magnitude of your original vector, being able to measure this angle right here, and then maybe being able to measure this angle down in the plane. If you could measure that magnitude and these two angles, it's pretty easy to figure out what those scalar components would be in that expression, right? It would just be A, sine, cosines, and so on and so forth. It's a geometric e exercise. We know such a representation exists. Such a representation indeed exists. But as I said early on in the class, 
in three-dimensional analysis, in two dimensions, it's usually pretty easy to see what these magnitudes and angles are. If you're working in a plane, it's much easier to see what those angles are. When you're working in three-dimensional space, uh, the geometric approach isn't always the best way to go. We need to have uh, some more sort of algebraic, some more heavy weaponry to get us where we need to go. So let me show you how this works. And we'll explain the very first equation that appears on the general force outline. Starting off with this. We know that given a vector in an orthonormal triad, we know that such a representation exists. But we may not yet know what the appropriate scalar components are. We know that we can figure them out if we can measure certain magnitudes and angles. But maybe, maybe we're not able to do that for some reason. So the idea is, how can we take this equation and do something algebraic to figure out what the appropriate scalar components should be? And my idea is something that we'll use quite a bit of as we go through the course. I refer to it as the method of projection. We start off with a relationship that we know exists. And just take the dot product on both sides of the equation with in this case, let's dot it through on both sides with the second unit vector from the side. <laughs> on the left-hand side, it's obvious what you're going to get. On the right-hand side, you would have this, of course. Um, and does anybody have the... Uh, that from you for just a second. <coughs> this is where it's important to know the properties of vector algebra, not just the geometry of it, but the algebraic properties. Uh, what can we do with the right-hand side of this equation in light of the properties listed in this box? Well, first of all, we know that the dot product <laughs> distributes to a sum, yes? <laughs> So on the next line, I could write this dot would be 2 plus this dot would be 2 plus this dot. We could do that, but I'm going to skip that step because that's an easy step. And, and look, what's another property? Does, can a scalar multiple be pulled out of the operation itself? Mm -hmm. that's, that's line number two. So if we use those well-known properties of vector algebra, and I'll, again, I'll skip those two steps, is it obvious that the right-hand side is going to reduce all the way down to what? Scalar A1 times E1 down to E2 plus scalar A2 pulled out times E2 down to E2 plus A3. E3 down to E2. Pretty obvious that that's what it's going to boil down to, right? Just using the known algebraic properties of the, of the dot product. And then... <coughs> What makes an orthonormal triad an orthonormal triad? <coughs> a dot product of any one with any other is only going to be <coughs> one or zero. And it's going to be one when the two indices are the same. And it's going to be zero when they're not. So the entire right-hand side of the equation just reduces to a1 times 0 plus a2 times 1 plus a3 times 0 for a grand total of a2. And the equation that comes out of that is that the second scalar component is just going to be the dot product of the vector that you were given with the second unit vector from the set. And by the way, do you think we could add an equation above this and one below it? I don't even think I need to explain that. All we have to do is start here with either, instead of using 2, use 1, or use 3, and we would show all of these things. So that's an algebraic truth. <coughs> the scalar component in the standard form representation of a vector relative to an orthonormal triad are always <coughs> equal to the dot products of the vector with that particular unit vector from, that, from the set. And if we go back to uh, page one of the general course outline, just to 
And mind you, that's what the very first equation on the general force outline really says. It just reminds you that if you have such a triad and a vector A, the standard form representation of that vector relative to that set is expressed in terms of these three singular components, just the three individual dots. Now, the next little guy, <coughs> strange looking little equation, uh, relates to what is called the parallel perpendicular decomposition. Uh, and the parallel perpendicular decomposition is something that uh, typically isn't talked about in a two-dimensional dynamics class. It's not really needed. But it's huge. It's of huge importance in a three-dimensional class, as we will see all the way to the end of the class. This relationship becomes one of the most important things that we have. Uh, so let me get a little uh, keynote slideshow up here. Uh, to show you how this goes down. And this is the right one, I hope. That was a problem earlier. Okay. Okay, and let's see how this looks. Parallel perpendicular decomposition. What is this? All about? Well, to even discuss the <laughs> parallel perpendicular decomposition, I think we can do it in seven minutes. You start off needing to know two things. You need to have a vector. I'm not saying what kind of vector, but you need to have a Euclidean vector to decompose, and you need to have a special direction relative to which the decomposition is to take place. So in this case, we're going to start off assuming that we have a vector A, and we know it, let's assume that's in a known box. And we have a special unit vector, lambda hat. That's the direction relative to which the decomposition is to take place. Now let's, let's just show you how this, what this is all about. First of all, everyone knows, now here's the unit vector lambda, right? Would you agree that, and it's right along that dotted line, would you agree that at every point along that line there is a plane which is a unique plane which is normal and perpendicular to that one. That's a property of three-dimensional Euclidean space. So let's add that. Let's add lambda's normal plane to the picture. So that plane right there is the one that passes through this point, which is perpendicular, normal to lambda. Another thing that you know is that in three-dimensional space, if you have any two intersecting lines, any two intersecting lines are contained within a unique plane. So let's add the blue plane which contains A and lambda. We'll call that the A and lambda plane. Now within that plane, you'll see what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to draw a line through this tip parallel to this, and then I'm going to draw another line parallel to that intersection line. And you see that those lines have been added. We've done this on the board just a few minutes ago. Let's assume that we measure, let's assume not only do we know the magnitude of this vector, but we've also been able to measure the angle theta. Having measured that angle, is it obvious, as it was in the things we were doing on the board, is it obvious that that vector A can now be broken down into the sum of two vector components like that? There's the cosine theta component. By the way, you notice that that cosine component is parallel to the special direction lambda? Whereas this sine component down here, you'll notice that that is what? Perpendicular to lambda. And that's where the names come from. It's obvious if you look at this picture, that therefore, that given any vector in any special direction, it is geometrically obvious that that vector can be expressed as the direct sum of two vector components, one of which is parallel to the special direction the other of which is perpendicular to the special direction. Now, so far, it's very geometric. We need to get algebraic. Uh, first of all, it's obvious that the parallel component is expressible like that, and that's because <coughs> it points in the lambda direction. Uh, but what if you were asked, what if you just for the fun of it, computed the dot product of the two vectors that you were given initially? Is it clear that the dot product of lambda with A would be magnitude times magnitude times cosine of the angle would be equal to this? Is it therefore obvious that another way of writing the parallel component 
an alternate way of writing this would be this, yes? That's pretty obvious. So let's save that relationship, and now let's take a look at the other component, the perpendicular component. Now, the perpendicular component uh, is this magnitude, A sine, and it points in some direction down here in the normal plane. Now, in a three-dimensional problem, how many unit vectors are there in that normal plane? There's an infinity of unit vectors down there. Now, remember, we weren't given this. The only two things we knew in the beginning were what? Lambda hat and A. Those are the two things that we knew about. The only thing we can say about this unit vector down here, the only thing we can say about it is we know that it's one of the many vectors which is perpendicular to that. But again, there are many. And here's your starting expression for the perpendicular component. And hmm, I'm just wondering, let's compare that expression to what you would get if you took the two vectors that you would give in the beginning and you crossed them. Lambda cross with A would be what? Magnitude times magnitude times sine of the angle between them. And the direction of a cross product would be the right hand rotation rule normal to the plane, normal to the blue plane. And what would that look like? Would you agree that that's that blue vector is what the cross product would look like? Notice that its magnitude is the same as that but its direction is 90 degrees away. Uh, but you know what? Look at those three little unit vectors colored in that uh, frog green. What do you notice when you look at those three unit vectors? Do you notice that they, those three little unit vectors are all unit vectors and they're all mutually perpendicular? Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, if you order them, <laughs> lambda, mu, and nu, don't they form a right-handed orthonormal triad? One of our friends, right? Our right-hand orthonormal triad. So I wonder what would happen, what would happen if we took this expression for lambda cross A, and what if we crossed it through again with lambda? What if we took lambda cross with this? Ooh, well, you'd get what? A sine of theta, lambda cross mu. And what's the value of lambda crossed with mu? Minus mu. Uh, OK. Well, uh, just do a little comparison here. What do you notice if you make that comparison? What I notice is that this is the same as this except for the minus sign. Therefore, I conclude that the perpendicular component is going to be the negative. And um, I don't like that negative sign, and you probably don't either. And there's two ways you can get rid of it. If you switch the position of two vectors in the cross product, don't you introduce a minus sign? Mm -hmm. So I can get rid of that minus sign by switching these two graphs. Or I could switch this whole term with this to get rid of it. So there are two different ways that I can get rid of the minus sign. Uh, and, and that's what we do. You'll notice that if you make uh, if you switch this with this, uh, you end up with this expression. And if you switch those two guys, you end up with this expression. So you get two equivalent expressions for computing the perpendicular component. And notice both of those expressions involve only the things that you were given in the beginning, right? Only the things that you were given in the beginning, lambda and a were the two given. So that's a pretty powerful expression. And we can summarize that very nicely by getting rid of all the intermediate stuff and pulling it all up there. And if we go back, and if you'll allow me, give me a second. Oh, by the way, as so you look at those two expressions, if you had, you don't have to memorize these because they're on page one of the general course outline, which you always have available. But if you had to do a memory thing, it's always the vector A in the middle with lambdas straddling it on both sides. And remember, it doesn't matter whether you do that cross product first or this one. Evidently, you get the same, you get the same result. Uh, in any case, let's just go back and end up by showing you uh, page one of the general course outline, just to reassure you that that is the equation that's listed there.
every vector, given any vector a and any special direction lambda, that vector has a unique decomposition into two additive components, one of which being parallel to lambda, the other being perpendicular. And these are the nice <coughs> algebraic formulas for computing those two components. I wanted to get to an example. We ran out of time, so we'll start right off on Wednesday. I'll give you a nice concrete three-dimensional example of how to use that to do a three-dimensional geometry. So, see you on Wednesday. <coughs>